I can't guarantee it because I'm not very good with technology. Um, hopefully it will work. It worked yesterday for my Japanese class. And just uh, please indulge me for one moment. Uh, just one thing to remember, you know, you're in the finals, right? You're thinking about grades. I got only so many hours to divide up between studying, preparing for tests, um, right? That's kind of your focus now. One thing just as reminders, you're studying for this, just think how much you've learned this semester, right? About how the world works, about how it moves. And I think as you find is you have the summer, hopefully you're gonna come across times when you're going to see um, where the knowledge you've gained here has helped you to understand current events better. At least that's what I've intended it to do. That's how, that was a part of how I designed the course. So there we go. That being said, let's start the review. Questions? Yeah, Julie. Who's the Battle of Agua against Ethiopia versus Italy. Right? Um, and that's a identification. So let's, let's use that as an example of how, what makes a good identification, right? Um, key, of course, first of all, is um, you'll see in the identification tell us how to write one. Uh, remember what it was, right? So what was this battle? Well, it was a battle, but <laughs> what kind of battle? Right, right, exactly, exactly. So it's a battle, and like you said, it's between Italy and Ethiopia. And who wins the battle? Ethiopia. Ethiopia. Why is that important? Because they were one of the only African nations that was independent. Exactly. Right. Most of Africa gets partitioned, gets divided. Uh, Ethiopia holds out until 1936. So it doesn't complete it, keep its independence completely, but it does last until um, 1936. Right. So this um, this makes it something that's different. Okay, so what it was, we got that. When was it? 1896. Yeah. 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 Right, right. So again, that points it in the area of high imperialism. 1896? Yeah. Right. They, they ended up losing it 40 years earlier, but the, the area of high imperialism is the time um, you know, when Africa is being divided up amongst everyone. Um, we hit, and so that's the kind of thing, if you can give me all of that, that gives you basically kind of a B answer, right? Um, the question is, how is this significant to other times and places? If you can answer that, then you get up to the A range. So why is this important for later on? Yeah, Eric. Well, because the notion was that the, the Africans were not mm -hmm. as powerful as the white men, but it proves that they beat them in battles using their weapons. Right. So it proves that anybody can be anybody if it doesn't matter. Exactly, exactly. If you can. Um, Africans can learn to pull triggers just as well as Westerners, as white people, right? Exactly. So this shows, you know, this calls into question European dominance. And we're gonna see this continuing on um, throughout history. So that's excellent. That's a perfect example of how you would then tie this to a larger theme. Um, to add just one other that I think is important, how, had Ethi was Ethiopia a new country or an old country? Old country, right. Right, had a long had a king, and what kind of ideology does that encourage them? You have a king, you've been around for a long time. Nationalism. Nationalism, right. That's one big advantage that they have. And this is another example, right? Not only can we borrow new kinds of technology, we can also bother borrow new ideas. So right, this is we see and we see here the power of nationalism where the Ethiopians are able to organize a large army um, that is, knows how to use Western weapons, right? And they're able to win. So that's an example, right? You see that kind of progression, right? If you tell me what it is, when it is, and it's immediate historical significance, you're in the B range. Give me that little extra bit that's A. Yeah, Karen. Um, with the term nationalism, how would you give it a time, I guess? Pick an example and give the time of that particular example, or would you need to start like from the beginning when nationalism started to kind of arise? Like, you have to say what they were doing just right oh, now. You could stay pretty much within the context of Africa for this kind of answer. Well, I, mean, I mean, for nationalism. Oh, nationalism! Yeah. Oh, and nationalism is an idea. Yeah. I did. You would want to give us an idea. You know, it starts coming around in the, the 18th century, okay. for example, when it is, and then it stays. In, and I, one thing I've tried to argue is that it's important even to this day, right? That mm -hmm. even when you have the nationalist parties, uh, I'm sorry, when you have even the communist party, they're all national, right? And it, even though that communism has been basically rejected in substance by Soviet, by uh, by China by North Korea, by all these other places, they still, what exists still is nationalism instead. So that's kind of, um, right, well, we're there. So 
So, so that's kind of the limit is, right? Something that's beginning in the 18th century and continues to this day, right? It's an important um, part of the world and we kind of hit on why it's still important today. Um, what, um, oh, I think we answered a lot of that. What is it so well, does anyone want to add anything to that? Why else is it important? Yeah, Alex. Oh, I'm sorry, we're curious. Okay, right, right. Does anyone remember the example I gave from, um, World War One, what people were doing in order to, to um, support the German war effort? Yeah, people were, were sending in their wedding rings to the government, melting down the gold, and the government would send you an iron ring in return. I thought it was rust proof. Yeah, that German never wash their hands, or just, I guess, took off their rings. Right, but this is, the key thing then is that what this is convincing you to do is that you should sacrifice everything for the benefit of the nation, right? Your family comes second, your religion comes second, so it can be part of national identity, right? It's complex. Your village comes second. Primary is the nation state, right? And how does that then affect, um, what's the deal? Does anyone remember about the Armenian genocide, right? That's a stat, that happens as Turkey is taking form as a nation state. Why is the old Ottoman Empire able to tolerate Armenians and the nationalistic modern Turkey isn't? Exactly, exactly. Because the nation is dominant, it has to hold, it has to have all the cards. You all have to be one nation. You can't tolerate ethnic minorities because they can endanger the nation, right? They're potentially traitors, right? These Armenians are Christians, as Eric pointed out, they may look to the West, and they're not Turks, right? They're dangerous. So they can be tolerated in the old way, but not in the new. And that's where nationalism leads to a lot of these things like genocide, like the Holocaust, things like that, right? So it's a very potent weapon. Um, in terms of anti-colonization, right? If you're China, if you're Korea, you can use nationalism to overthrow the old empires to gain your independence. That's kind of, we can say, the good part of nationalism from many people's perspective. The negative part, though, is that uh, you can use it to justify uh, discriminating against and even killing um, ethnic minorities, right? So that's some examples of things that would give you broader significance. Yes, Matthew? Let me talk about the major restoration. Major restoration, okay. Hit all the IDs first, excellent. So, okay, we'll just go through it. What is the Meiji Restoration? Julie? Wasn't it the time in Japan where they um, went to the West to really update their political and social society? You're one step advanced, right? The Meiji Restoration leads to what you're talking about. Okay. So you're right to connect that in your idea. Your question goes more to significance. Okay. But that's good. You're on the right track, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, Alex. The, um, the Japanese reinstall the emperor and the state. Mm -hmm. uh, right. Exactly, exactly. So the emperor, previously the shogun had real power, ruling in the name of the emperor. They got rid of the shogun and said, now the emperor is going to be in charge. Right? And that's, does anyone remember the approximate time? I won't necessarily ask for an exact year. You get the exact year, kudos. But, yeah, Eric? 1868. 1868. So, and this is key to remember for this time, this is rising Western, Europe, what, what, rising Western dominance, right? This is 24 uh, years after, the, no, I'm sorry. Well, about 22, three decades after this, right, um, Africa is going to be partitioned, right? And this is then where what, um, eight, or, I'm sorry, what Julie was saying is this is what you're saying is the significance, right? This is important because with the Meiji Restoration, they bring this emperor into power. Right? And it's interesting because they use him as a source of Japanese identity, right? He's traditional Japanese, he's our link to the past. But he's also a model for reform, right? Remember when he gets his hair cut, so does everyone else. That scene in The Last Samurai where the guy gets his hair cut and screams, no, you know, willing to die. All they do is show him a picture of the emperor with his hair cut short, the guy would have done it, <laughs> right? And that's where you're, what you were saying about industrial, or about looking to the West comes in. Through the emperor, they put him in Western clothes. They're able then to um, use him as a way to justify radical Western reform, right? And that then allows Japan. Oh, I'm sorry. What does that then allow Japan to do? 
Right, to modernize, which then allows them to escape. Colonization. Colonization, exactly. Right, this is a key thing, is that by undergoing this radical reform, Japan is able to avoid the fate of um, China, right? Um, where China, oh, I'll come back to that, right? It's able to avoid the fate of many African nations. Um, it's able to avoid the fate of India, right? So this is why, this is one aspect of why that's key, right? If you get that, that's right there to be an answer. Right? How do we make it an A answer? What is this overall significance for our course? Drew? An example of how uh, superior the West got. Mm -hmm. Exactly, that's a big point. Another big point, I can't remember who said it, someone got it, oh, I think it was Eric said earlier, this is an example of how the West, um, I'm sorry, how um, non-Western people, non-white people, are able to adopt Western techniques successfully, right? Similar to in, you know, what we have in the Battle of Ottawa, you had that with Japan, but different from Ethiopia, Japan manages to stay completely, um, completely independent. And just to decide, what happens when Japan rejects the West and says, we're going to go our own way? What, is that, what is event does that lead to? Drew? They get firebombed with their nukes. Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't work, right? Japan gets firebombed and nukes when they reject the West. Um, it helps lead to World War, and that, of course, is because of World War II. <coughs> right? So this, again, shows, uh, if you want to point to the power of the West. So that's, you know, like this B answer, you can tell me what it is, and then you can tell me the overall significance. That's that you're getting into the A range. Um, let's see. Well, while we're, we're on Japan, let's look at one of these essay questions, right? So Japan is successful at doing this. And your second essay question is compare the efforts of China and Japan to respond to growing European and American powers in the 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, how successful is each country and why? We've already got half the answer, right? Japan is fabulously successful. It's not colonized until it turns from the West. When the Americans, we didn't talk about so much in class, the Americans occupy Japan, we rewrite their constitution for them. We do a good job, but we still rewrite their constitution. So what about China? What's China? Well, first of all, how is China's response different from Japan? Yeah, Phil. The one thing, <coughs> their period of Right, right. In the early 20th century, when China finally decides that it's going to modernize, it doesn't have any time. Right? The 100 Days Reform in 1895 is called the 100 Days Reform because it lasted 100 days. <laughs> That's not very long to change a whole society. Right? Um, and why? Why were the Chinese, were they just stupid? Were they just stubborn? I mean, why didn't they change? Uh, Japan did, as it were. Drew? Exactly, exactly. Remember, the Japanese emperor is ethnically Japanese. He has reigned for, well, the claim was he had reigned for 2,600 years, the same dynasty in Japan. So he was seen as a repository of traditional <coughs> Japanese culture, right? So he's a source of unity that you can rally around, and then you can use that to use him as a model to transform. In China, the Qing dynasty was ethnically foreign, right? They're Manchu. And they justify their right to rule by appealing to Confucian universalism, right? We should rule because we're the most moral. As soon as you adopt something like nationalism, as soon as you get rid of that Confucian learning, which you need to do if you want to modernize, you lose that legitimacy. Right? So for the Qing to embrace reform would destroy their right to rule. And that's one reason after they, they start undertaking radical reforms in the early 1900s, they're gone by 1911. Right? It doesn't work for them. Um, let's make sure we're, we're getting the question here. Um, right. So that gets into the early 1900s, but they're doing they're they're being exposed earlier than that, right? China. I mean, Japan in 1853, Perry comes in, opens them up. 1868, you have the Meiji Restoration. They react quickly. What about China? Well, they were very close off and not open to the ideas of Japan with the technology, and then mm -hmm. um, the opium started with Japan. Right. And they created Japan with opium, and I think it was in the 60s, that's why people opium. The West were actually introduced and did produce more opium in China. Right. And then um, once they started putting in their new methods, which were particularly kind of forced um, in the one that Boxer Bowling happened, mm -hmm. and that was seen with Lash was wanting to return to tradition. Exactly. 
Right, exactly, exactly. So you have a kind of a, the Japanese were used to adapting to foreign cultures. They had borrowed a lot from China. Um, I think I showed you in this class how Japanese people use Chinese characters to write. So they were used to borrowing things. It was much easier for them. China was used to being the center of the world in their point of view. They didn't see the point of change. Uh, China was, in a sense, a victim of its own success. Right? This has always worked, so why should we keep doing it? Right? Um, and what happens also, uh, Julie gave us several examples. China gets in several disastrous wars. It gets in two opium wars. Uh, the Qing government decides to rally behind the Boxer Rebellion, and each time it loses, and each time it has to pay gobs and gobs of cash to the West. Which, of course, if you're paying out that money, you can't use it to reform. Japan doesn't do that. Japan only fights wars that it knows it can win. Right? It defeats the, Ru it defeats the Chinese in 1895. It gets a lot of money from China because of that. And it defeats the Russians in 1905. So the Japanese know how to pick their battles. And that's another key, um, key difference. Um, do we talk about, does anyone recall what the Taiping Re Rebellion was? Yeah, Eric. Uh, between 1850 and 1864, religious slaughter <coughs> in the Qing. Yeah. And they seized the heartland of China and killed about 20 million people. Exactly. Massive rebellion kills lots of people, takes away the um, large part of the uh, empire that can no longer be used for taxes and so forth. Did we talk about any Taiping rebellions in Japan? Matthew? What was that question? Oh, the Taiping Rebellion. I was asking um, if about rebellions in China. Um, or I, well, actually, I asked what the Taiping Rebellion was, right? This massive rebellion um, in China from 1850 to 1864 kills about 20 million people and uh, takes a large chunk of the country out of the control of the emperor, meaning he can't collect taxes from it, and he has to use troops to get rid of it. Did we talk about any massive rebellions in Japan? No. There were rebellions, but they weren't like the Taiping, right? The Meiji Restoration lasted one year, about nine months. That last, in 1868, the top school of the Shogun lasts about nine months. Emperor gets overthrown. I'm sorry, the Shogun gets overthrown in about nine months in 1868. It's over. And the new dynasty, or sorry, the Emperor is now in power as are his advisors. Not many, only a few thousand people die. The Taiping Rebellion lasts 14 years, kills 20 million people, takes away all this wealth, and it resolves nothing. Right? So this is part of some of the differences, right, that are affecting um, what's going on in China and Japan. Japan realizes how to respond, realizes its position of weakness, responds to the West by trying to modernize and trying to reform. Doesn't get in battles it can't win. Manages to avoid serious rebellions. China is not able to do that. In large part because China <coughs> doesn't have that tradition of being flexible, of adopting foreign people's ways, um, and in part because tradition had worked so well for so long. And of course, because tradition was how the Qing justified their right to rule. And to get rid of tradition, they no longer have the right to rule, they get overthrown. So, and just one thing to point out, the reason I wanted to go over, I gave, gave those specific events, writing a strong essay in a history class. What I want to do, if you, the way historians think, the way that we write articles and so forth is, we take specific facts. Typing Rebellion, this is what happened. Boxer Rebellion, this is what happened. And we weave those into an argument, right? So you say, for example, so we know that China, J Japan, China fought wars that it was not able to, or China backed the losing uh, powers. China fought wars it knew it couldn't win. We know this because it fought the Opium Wars, we know it because it fought the Boxer Rebellion, we know it because of the Taiping Rebellion and so forth. Right? Also, just as a side remembrance, the Taiping Rebellion was only put down um, when Westerners helped. They relied on Western troops. And of course, fabulous martial arts, you remember from the clip we watched. More questions? Yeah, Eric. Um, on the multiple choice, who is Alan Hume in the National Congress? Sure. Anyone recall who Alan Hume is? We had a little video on it. He's the other economist? No, that's Hayat. Close, though. Yeah, Phil. He was the. Mm -hmm. 
once they help India modernize it, they should leave and right. let India be a sovereign nation. Exactly. Exactly, right? He's interesting. He says, um, to, to just to summarize again what Phil said, Phil nailed it. Um, he thinks that the British are there to help India, to help civilize India according to English standards, and once that is done, they should leave India. And so one thing he does is he helps organize the Indian National Congress. And uh, with that, right? And what's the Indian National Congress do? Right, Karen? Exactly. Exactly, right. This is a group that doesn't, remember, the Indian experience is going to be very different from other countries. They're not going, the British are willing to negotiate an into colonization. And a lot of that is done through the National Congress Party, which is itself started by an Englishman. Right? He's essential for starting Congress. Right? He's kind of the guy that initially gets it, o gets it together. And Mahatma Gandhi will eventually turn it into a mass party, where it just, you just have to pay a little bit of money and you can join. And that helps him engage in these mass movements. Right, that will help um, force to, where Britain basically has to make a choice between killing lots of people or leaving India. Um, and the British decide that they would rather, in part because of their connections with mass media, because it will look bad, they decide they will leave India. It's also hard when you say you're coming to civilize someone to go around killing them. Yeah, good question. Yeah, Karen. Okay. So what is, first of all, who is the first world? Just to make sure we're all on the same page. Right, right. Okay, liberal democracies and capitalist countries. Places like the US, Western Europe, Japan. So, what's the strengths of these countries in terms of trying to convert people to their worldview, in, in terms of trying to get them to other countries to embrace liberal democracy <coughs> um, and capitalism? Drew? They have lots of wealth. They're wealthy, exactly. Private property. Right, and those two things are connected, right? If you believe in this system, if you set the system, you can get wealthy and have a lot of property for yourself, provided you work hard. Right. Any other strengths? Yeah, Karen? Just the idea of freedom. Right. And the high standards of living. Yeah, G.I. Joe. Right? You're not going to get oppressed. You have to, uh, I'll just add to that a little bit. Sure, sure, no, we discussed in an earlier class how G.I. Joe um, shows people's desire for freedom. What's the progression? I feel like capitalist societies are much more into progression because they're a competitive nature. People are more willing to work hard to beat out. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, so it grow, we'll, we'll put it also grows well. Is that what you mean? Exactly, exactly. So, um, right, so if you have, uh, so these are kind of the strengths. And to give you an example, something that would be good to point out, right? What's the deal with Japan? Why is Japan an important example? I mean, I put up Western Europe, I put up US, those are countries that are traditionally secure for our water. Why Japan? Yeah, Phil? Exactly, exactly. This is kind of the promise of Western democracy, of liberal capitalism. Look at Japan. The Japanese become very powerful very quickly, right? 
and this really helps them. And so that's a key example you would want to mention um, there. So that's the strengths of the second first one. Let's look at the second one. What are the strengths? Of, well, first of all, who, who's the second world? Communism, yeah. And so this includes places like the Soviet Union, uh, later after 1949, China, um, after the revolution in Vietnam, um, Cambodia. I think those are the main, Cuba. And so what's the advantage of the second world? Yeah, Drew. Planned economy. Planned economy. Right, and, what's the, and how would they try and sell you a planned economy, right? This is the opposite. First world, free economy is the best. It'll make you wealthy. Why, is, why should you have this planned economy? Equality. 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 Less poverty. So if I can combine these two, to give you an example then of how this, what I'm talking about, historical logic, you would point out, um, or, or a way that we can combine these. Um, in liberal democrat democratic countries, you have unemployment because there's a free market for labor market. The labor market is a free market, right? Some people are trying to sell their labor, labor other people are trying to buy it. Currently, we're in a labor surplus. Right, so you don't get paid a whole lot for your labor, and many people are unemployed. In order to enact this, these countries often get had full employment, where they would make sure that everyone had a job. No one was unemployed, right? And that's certainly a selling point, right? Um, let's see. Except, what, what else is a planned economy? Has? Looking at it from the point of view of the state itself. Drew? It allows you to industrialize faster and work quick. Exactly, catch up quickly. This is where it's important, like I said, to identify who we're talking about, right? Soviet Union, China, Vietnam, Cambodia, Cuba. None of these were wealthy, powerful countries at the time that they became communist. Right? The countries that are in the first world, except for the this exception, are these powerful Western countries, right? Why is, so what this means then, these countries, as Drew points out, these countries, they're trying to catch up. Remember, when the Soviet Union comes to power, Stalin, um, or I'm sorry, it's not Stalin, uh, well, Lenin and then Stalin, they say, hey, we gotta catch up to the Westerners. We have to do it quickly. And we'll do that by having a planned economy, because the market's inefficient. We will plan the economy, arrange things so we can build a powerful nation state, right? So it's still nationalist, right? Also, you'll notice Vietnam, Cuba, and Cambodia were all colonies, right? None of these countries were. China was never actually a colony, but lost a large amount of its sovereignty, right? So communism, one of its strengths, one thing that makes it attractive is that you can use it to obtain national independence. So this is one of the strengths. Communist parties were very good at obtaining national independence, at overthrowing old colonies. Cuba did not become a fully functional, independent, rich, well, it's not really rich now. Um, it's probably not the best example. But right, these countries managed to gain their independence and some level of economic modernity through a communist revolution. So one of its strengths of communism is it's very attractive to people who are the have-nots in the world because it promises wealth, it promises power. Right? And it promises to get rid of the inequalities. So these are kind of the, if we reverse this, these are kind of the weaknesses of the first world. Right? Yeah, Lacey. Um, is uh, competition seen like you put in that same category? Or is that like my thing? Like competition they're trying to like, uh, you know, grow their own market and not have to depend on the West? That's something that North Korea tended to emphasize. 
Um, even though we're seeing massive, right, right. For the communists, a lot of times they emphasize they should work together as a flaw. The communists want to work together to make sure that other communist countries are strong, even though there's divisions. The liberal democracies also will say we should work together to oppose the communists. I think you're, you're thinking of North Korea, which is kind of a different view. But that's good. That's good you're picking up on that. Right. So now, one of the strengths, of course, then, um, so this is the strength of communism, right? It attracts revolutionaries. It attracts people who want to overthrow the government that it has. And what particular individuals is it going to attract? Weak followers? Yeah. Yeah, people who are have-nots, weak people. It's going to attract, like you said, illiterate peasants with the promise of land, right? And we saw in that video, right, the Soviet Union was really ready to arm illiterate peasants and train them how to overthrow revolutionaries. So that's one of the strengths. How does that then influence Western? So that's, so in terms of how they fought then, right, um, the war, uh, they're going to encourage revolution. <laughs> using peasants a lot of the time. Now I should point out, not all communists were illiterate peasants, right? Do you remember what kind of education did Pol Pot and Ho Chi Minh have? French. French, right. They both, I think, went to Paris to study. So they were knowledgeable people, right? But they learned about communism there, and then brought it back to overthrow things. So okay, so these are the advantages that the second world has, right? This is why many people are attracted to it. If you're a peasant, have not, who are being dominated by rich capitalists, you're not going to embrace liberal democracy, right? You're going to embrace communism. So how does then the first world react to that tactic? What happened in Guatemala? Sent in, sent in uh, nationals who wanted to get rid of communism? Right, right, we set up a coup. Right, a military nationalist, right? So, so the United States will, you know, we're going to, if they're going to encourage revolutions, uh, we're also going to be willing to use coups and uh, other means, right? So there was democratically elected government, but it was left wing. So we were willing to kind of overthrow it in the coup, right? And we helped prepare lists of suspected communists, and some of those people were captured and um, tortured and killed then by the Guatemalan government, right? And so one way you can think about this, now, now how did the Americans then, just so we can understand how this is working, how does the United States justify this, right? We overthrow a democratically <laughs> elected regime, but we're supposed to be for liberal democracy. How do we justify that? Kind of two reasons. Right, Drew. Uh, better the guy in charge is dictator than communist. Yeah, right, exactly. We don't want communists um, around, right? Look what happened in Cuba. They re Russians brought in nuclear missiles. If we allow communists, that's a threat to our national security. So we're kind of willing to bend ideological. Um, um, feeling I, uh, our devotion to liberal democracy in order to defend um, our security. And also there was an understanding that, you know, these peasants, they're illiterate. They don't really understand what's good for them. They don't realize that after they, the, the communists are promising that we'll give you land, they're not telling them that later on they plan to take the land away. We need to prop up dictators until the country gets wealthy enough so that people can get educated so that they can have a true democracy, right? So we'll support non we'll support anti-communist dictators with the idea that their economy will grow and eventually they'll have true democracy. So economy first, then democracy. So you think about the Soviet Union wants to act quickly, get rid of people, uh, quickly set up communist governments. You know, the West says, no, we need to take our time and carefully build the economy and then liberal democracy will come in. So, <coughs> sorry, Karen, does that answer yeah. your question? Yeah, uh, Ali. Um, can you the caste war? Sure. Okay. So when is the caste war? Or first of all, where is the caste? Oh, one thing I just want to point out. One thing that I notice that people sometimes have trouble with on their tests, or their, when they're answering things, is they remember concepts, but they sometimes attach them to the wrong country. Um, so for example, sometimes people had a hard time keeping in track 
okay, which, which was the conservative emperor and which was the radical emperor, right? And they confused that the radical, more radical kind of imperial system is with the Japanese and more conservative is with China. So you want to make sure when you're looking over the terms and things, especially remember what country this is associated with. That's very important. So, or geographic areas. So what geographical areas the caste war associated with? Eric. Mexico? Right, right, exactly. Exactly, Mexico. It's part of the Yucatan Peninsula. So that's the area. What's the approximate time period we're talking about? It's about 1850 to 1900. So the darn thing lasts 50 years. Right? And who's fighting? Right, it's a war. Eric? Uh, the Tunisian lion. Right. The, the Tunisian government state. Exactly. Exactly. What's happening is the, the um, Mexican state is trying, to grow, is trying to encourage the promotion of sugar the growth of sugar. So people are coming in, cutting down uh, rainforests and things to, and the, where the Mayans are living, to grow, grow sugar and trying to force Mayans to harvest the sugar, which we talked about. Harvesting sugar is not a fun job. It's backbreaking labor. It kills a lot of people. So they don't want to do that. And so eventually they rebel, right? You have massive fighting. You have real warfare that lasts something like 50 years. And what ends up happening is a new product is discovered in the area. Basically, there's a plant there that, that you can use to make rope. And that's then used to help put down. Um, and because of it, then you have an alliance between the government and between wealthy capitalists work together to put down the rebellion and to take over that area to use it to grow this product that makes rope. Right? And that's kind of how it ends. And its significance, in <coughs> large part, is the growth, the attempt of Latin American states to grow and to centralize, right? This is the Mexican government trying to gain control over territory that is supposedly its own territory, right? And it only manages to do that by working together with business. And so this is an example. Um, liberal democracy and capitalism typically go hand to hand. Hand in hand, not hand to hand, I'm sorry. They go together, hand in hand. And this is also important because it shows in Latin America, different from the United States, um, you have this uh, emphasis where the elites are really in power, right? They don't share power like they do in the United States as much or in the European countries. Remember, after World War I, 1920s and 1930s, when the United States and when Western Europe were threatened by radicalism, by socialism and communism, they used their liberal democracy to pass reforms that make people happy so they won't go radical. And that's one reason the liberal democracies do not become authoritarian states like Germany and Japan um, and so forth. Now the, um, right, and so that's kind of the broader connection, right, that you could tie it to in order to put, bump that into an A answer, right, that kind of significance. One thing I just want to point out, going back to a question, um, one of the weaknesses, right, of the first world Remember that video I showed you on housing in Detroit? How was that a weakness? Yeah, Eric. Uh, not everyone was equal. Yeah, yeah, right. The idea was, um, and I pointed out, you know, in the 20s and 30s and even into the 40s, the United States and other countries were afraid of um, the growth of um, radicalism. The people would want to overthrow the government uh, and put in place one where they shared property, right? The, the idea of private property was under assault. So the g solution in the United States was to say, well, we'll just have mortgages, 15, 30 year mortgages, so everyone can become homeowners. Because if you own private property, you won't join a group that believes in abolishing private property. And, but what group was excluded from the loans? African yeah, African Americans found it very difficult to get loans, right? And this then leads, in a part, to riots in the 1960s that target property. Right? So that, and of course, this is a weakness that the second world will point out. Uh, the liberal democracies are racist. Right? It makes it hard to attract African leaders to your cause if in your country you discriminate against them. 
right? How do you con convince black Africans that you believe in them, that you'll support them when you discriminate against black Americans? Right? So that's a weakness of the first culture. Right. Ali, did I answer your question? I, yeah. I know I went down a bunny trail there, but I wanted to. I just to, wanted to make sure I had that thing. Okay, excellent. By the way, I do have a method to my madness. It may seem like I'm rambling. When you take the test, you'll understand. Yeah, at least. I'm actually, I'm, thank you for bringing that up. Um, there's two concepts, globalization, democracy, democracy, and globalization of culture of the economy. Um, Please cross out globalization and democracy. We didn't have time to, to cover that on Wednesday. I thought we would, we didn't, so I'm not gonna ask you a question on that. Um, globalization of culture, we didn't quite get to. Globalization of the economy, right? Um, when the first and the second worlds, remember, we talked about this three world order, right? When the first and the second worlds break down, right, you no longer had this block of liberal democracies that only wanna trade with themselves, and you no longer have this block of communist countries that no longer want to, want to trade with themselves. Now you have a whole world that can engage in trade. So in the 70s, but especially into the 80s and 90s, you had this massive increase in international trade, right? Um, because this world order breaks down, right? So that's what we talk about as increasingly globalized countries. When I was young, the idea of going to China or Soviet Union was not something we would consider. We just didn't do it because they were communists. And I used to pejorative on purpose. Now, you wouldn't think about it. Why? Because you live in a globalized <coughs> country. I grew up in a three world system. Yeah, Karen. Um, how many short answers do you um, Short answer, there should be 10. You see, the test format at the top explains what it should be. I think there is an error, though it says essay one times 10 points, it should be one times 20 points. Um, but yeah, good question. Yeah, Matthew. So the three world system. Oh. Like after, after the Cold War? Sure. The three world system, good question. Um, right? We talked about the first world, we talked about the second world, right? You have the third world, which are not aligned, right? But which are being pulled between the different countries, right? The first world wants to convert third world countries to liberal democracies, the second world wants to convert them to communist countries. And this period is from about 1945 until we'll say 1989, right? So this is after the war, um, until, the, until the, we can say the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the Soviet Union falls in the early 1990s. So that's kind of the, um, the period um, we're looking at that. When you, when you see three worlds, think liberal democracy, communism, and those who are caught in between, right? And I always remember, it was Westerners who came up with the first world, that, with that whole system, so that's why we call ourselves the first world. Communists would never accept being called the second world. Because they're the best from their point of view. So did that answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. Okay, excellent, excellent. I have a tendency to, historians, if you get us talking, we just won't stop. Yeah, Julie? Sure. Um, we hit on that a little bit. Uh, did everyone get what they needed here? Okay. Um, Stalin had this idea, socialism in one country. Why is that problematic? Why is that kind of a paradox? Exactly, exactly. In theory, communism is the antithesis very much against nationalism, because your class, the fact that you're a worker is supposed to be more important than whether you're German, French, or Indian. Right, so when Stalin breaks this idea of socialism in one country, he's allowing this principle of nationalism to come in. And what this means, then, of course, is that later on you're gonna have all these nationalist communist parties. Right, so that's kind of a paradox within how it's actually practiced. Um, right, and let's see. 
who was supposed to um, benefit? What class is supposed to benefit the most from communism? Proletariat. Proletariat, right? Who are made up of? Working right, workers. And if you're in China, especially peasants. Right? 1980 in Poland, you have the beginning of a resistance movement to communism. 1980 Poland. What is that resistance movement? It's a labor movement. You have a union organizing against communism, which makes no sense if communism is doing what it's supposed to do. Right? Communism is supposed to be bringing this kind of, um, it's supposed to be helping the workers the most, and the workers are organizing against it. Right? And how, remember we talked about um, how workers, I'm trying to think of this, how, uh, how in the 50s and 60s did the Soviet Union respond to countries like Hungary or Czechoslovakia that sought to, um, to change the system, to reform things? These are communist satellite things. How did it respond? Tanks. With tanks. Yeah. Right? So again, this is supposed to be bringing worldwide revolution. But countries are trying to revolt against it. Right? And in, in order to keep them there, they're turning to these systems of oppression that I think Lenin, right, in that one where he would not have approved of. And that's again, going back to that essay question, that's one of the weaknesses of the second world, is they openly use coercion, right? The United States generally did not send in tanks in a way that could be traced back to us. <laughs> that was too clumsy. Um, while, we're, while we're on that subject, um, in 1989, right, when Gorbachev is in power and he's bringing his reforms, what does he do when people start saying that we should have uh, more reforms and maybe we don't want to be part of the Soviet Union or maybe we don't want to be communists? How does he react? No. He doesn't send anything. He doesn't send anything. He doesn't stop. Well, that's the other guy. Right? Well, at least for the person I talked, he maybe uses some oppression somewhere. But for, for our purposes, we want to, I want to emphasize that it's Deng. That's good. That's good. Deng sends in the tanks. Or China and Gorbachev respond differently. Gorbachev says, I'm going to follow political and economic reforms. At the same time, people start revolting. They say, OK, we want more. We want more. That's what happens when you try and reform. Sometimes people want too much. He does not send in the tanks. The Soviet Union falls apart. How does that contrast with Deng Xiaoping in China? He sends in the tanks. Right? And what kind of reforms does he allow? Only, only economic, right? The tanks are sent in against Tiananmen Square protesters, right? 1989. Um, and they're calling for democracy. This is an aside, also, one thing that you can use as a tool to, I know this is difficult, you're dealing with a lot of foreign names. Um, one thing you can think about, a way to remember this, right? Deng doesn't like democracy. D E D E. Right? Deng doesn't like democracy. Gorbachev doesn't like gore, so he doesn't want to kill people because that makes it very gory. It's funny, but you'll remember it. Right, Karen? Doesn't Deng go to Texas, though? Because everything is kind of, I, I thought his perspective changed a little bit. Oh, I'm glad you picked up on that. Right, he goes to Texas in 1979. His purpose is to try and open up trade with the United States for those economic reforms, right? So that's the example, of the, I'm glad that'd be a perfect thing to kind of bring up into an answer, right? He's for those economic reforms, but when people want to bring democracy, no dice. Yeah, Matthew. When you talk about the common war. I'm sorry, the what war? Oh, it's the war, let's see. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm a little, I had to throw out. Oh, Yamagata Aratomo. Okay, excellent, excellent. Um, who was it? I think, Phil, you, you presented on Yamagata Aritomo. Can you briefly fill us in what this is about? Um, well, that had to do with how Japan um, was going to treat China in order to preserve Asian sovereignty. Mm -hmm. And the reading was, was two parts. Um, the first part, Japan was saying that 
part af- was a conversation that Yamagata had um, after Japan formed an alliance with Britain. Mm-hmm. At that point, he said that uh, China, that they should still seek to, to cooperate, but more secretly, because they also needed it to um, seek out alliances with Western nations. Mm-hmm. Excellent, excellent. So it's trying to balance this kind of issue of race, right? Like we want to be with China because they're the same race, but we don't want to look too much like that. But the key thing to just remember, this is this idea of Asianism, right? That uh, yellow people should cooperate with each other. That Chinese and Japanese people should cooperate with each other in order to resist Western imperialism, in order to resist white imperialism. And also just an aside, when you're thinking too about the Meiji Restoration, um, in terms of significance, this is one significance, is that it leads to Japan being the only non-white major imperial power in the 19th century. Right? So I think that's key, is, that, is this idea of cooperation between, between yellow people against white people. But you have to be careful how you do it, as Phil pointed out. Oh, that's fine. I'm sorry. Oh, Chu Jin and Sun Yat-sen. Okay. Um, Chu Jin, real quick. Who who was Chu Jin? Right, right. Exactly from China. China. So you stick close. Right. That's what you really want to connect. Just as a clue, the way to tell Japanese names from Chinese names. Japanese names tend to be very long. Yamagata Aritomo. That's a mouthful. Chinese names tend to be a little more difficult for us to pronounce because they're so short, right? And they usually are two or three syllables long, right? Um, and, uh, right, so, so that just is a clue, right. And then so, what does she do, right? I think you said she's a reformer specifically, do you remember what she tries to do? <coughs> she tried to overthrow the Qing, the Qing government, right? But you're right to connect her with the exam system in a sense because she's a product, after they are getting rid of the exam system, People are turning to new systems of knowledge in the early 1900s. She actually goes to Japan to study. And in Japan, she's affected by radical ideas. And she comes back and seeks to overthrow um, the government. She does that by taking part in an assassination plot. <coughs> and then she's executed. Also an early feminist in China as well. So you want to connect her to that period, right, where the Qing dynasty is unraveling. And she's an example of how modern knowledge threatens uh, she's a stark, strict nationalist. She's not a Confucian, and that's why she wants to get rid of Sun Yat-sen. Okay, who's Sun Yat-sen? Eric. Uh, he established the Nationalist Party. Mm-hmm. Uh, he is an ethnic Han. Right. Uh, in, the, in the 1911 revolution, he was he chosen to be the first president of the or the president of the first Republic of China. Excellent. Right, right. Basic facts about his life. Excellent, right, so he is a reformer, he's a nationalist reformer in China, right? Ends up being elected first president, doesn't get to keep the coast because there's a guy with an army. <laughs> Son doesn't have an army, right? Uh, right, and what's his influence? <coughs> Who is he influenced by? What, well, first of all, what, and he would, I'm sorry, what was his title, Eric? He is an ethnic Han. Oh, I'm sorry, his title, when he, um, what's his position later after the revolution? President? Yeah, he's president. Right? He's influenced by liberal democracy, and he's a nationalist. Right? So he's looking towards the West. Right? He's also a member, he's a Protestant Christian, he's a Presbyterian. So he's looking towards the West, to the United States, specifically. Does he continue to look only towards the West? We'll talk a little bit about that. Who does he seek help from financially later on? Soviet Union. So Sun, and I think we talked about his three people's principles, right? That he also embraced a kind of socialism. So Sun Yat-sen is a complicated guy. Because on one hand, he looks to the West. He's a president. He wants a liberal democracy. He wants a republic. That's traditional Western stuff. But in the 1920s, the West isn't helping him out. He starts looking to the Soviet Union, to socialism, to planned economies. So he combines these things. 
and he combines this emphasis on um, liberal democracy, on nationalism, but he's willing to accept support and ideas like socialism. So he's kind of an in-between guy. Um, he's an example. Does anyone remember what the third way is? Yeah, Eric? Uh, we're not going to be liberal democracy, or we're not going to be socialist communism. We're going to try to find the best of both worlds. Mm -hmm. Make it the third world, mm -hmm. third way. Right, exactly. And that's one of the, um, that's a result of the 30 world system, right? Sun Yat Sen is kind of like the third way before this period, right? Sun Yat Sen lives before the three world system, but you can kind of see the roots of that. Right? And that's why you want to be third way. Remember we said there's these difficulties between the first world and second world, right? There's things you can criticize in the first world. There's things you can criticize in the second world. So many people say, let's follow a third way. Let's be different, right? Why is it hard to be different? So you can get the worst of both worlds and the best of both worlds. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you can get the worst of both worlds. You can have an oppressive regime that's poor, right? What else is a problem if we think about what's what else is going on in the three world system? Drew. Both uh, capitalist societies and communist societies will be trying to come from you. Yeah, exactly, exactly. They're going to both try and push you to join one side or the other. And if you don't join one side or the other, they may just jump in and take you over to make sure you don't go the wrong way. Um, Any other questions? So I'm just trying to recall something. Oh yes, okay, now I remember what I was trying to recall. How do liberal, does anyone remember what the IMF is? Because it's connected to this thing. Yeah, Alex. The National Monetary Fund. Right, exactly. And how does that help expand first, well, and what does it do? Well, basically, it just acts as like a, 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 a subnational loan for country, developing countries and countries needing money. Right, exactly. The, interna right, the International Monetary Fund, the IMF, <coughs> is, a, is a basically kind of a financial institution supported by liberal democracies that loan money to third world countries. Right? But if you want that money, you've got to bring in free trade and free market reform. That's one reason it's hard to follow the third way. To industrialize, to build a modern country, you need help from outside. Well, to get IMF help, you need to borrow money from the IMF to do that. Or I'm sorry, you need to industrialize, you need to borrow money to do that. To do that, you have to make changes that make you look more like a first world country. And it gives, that gives them power in there. Excellent, well that is all for today. I will try and get this posted by tomorrow at the latest, if the reporting works. Um, like I said, you're welcome to see me, especially on Monday. I'll be mocked from 2 to 5. If you want to bring your essay questions or IDs by, we can talk about them. Uh, and I will s good luck. I like your shirt. Thank you.